Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Anaya. I'm the dean of the University of Colorado Law School. It's uh, great to see so many familiar faces in the, in the crowd. Welcome to Colorado Law Talks, a lecture series that uh, brings our faculty uh, to uh, Denver to showcase their ideas and, and research and how they relate to the things around us. Uh, this evening, our speaker is Professor Aya uh, Gruber. Uh, we'd like to thank um, Haddon Morgan and Foreman, the law firm that is hosting us, and especially our, our uh, alum, uh, Ty Tyrone Glover, for making this evening possible. Um, I'm supposed to say that there is a reception afterwards, but I see the reception has already started. That's good. <laughs> so uh, I think it will continue afterwards, though. <laughs> so Aya I, uh, Gruber, Professor Aya Gruber joined, uh, joined us, joined the University of Colorado Law Faculty in 2010. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from UC Berkeley uh, and her law degree from Harvard Law School, where she was an editor on the Harvard Women's Law Journal and the Harvard International Law Journal. And she founded uh, the International uh, Law Students Association, the Interracial Law Students Association. Um, she clerked for U.S. District Judge uh, James L. King in Miami and then served as a felony trial attorney with the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., and then the, with the Public Defender uh, in Miami. Uh, her scholarship focuses, as we'll see, on feminist efforts to strengthen criminal law responses to crimes against women. Uh, she has received multiple awards, including awards for scholarship at the, at the law school. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Gruber. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, so just watch uh, Travis, the, uh, the drink there in front of the, OK, good. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the firm, and thank you to Dean Anaya. I want to give you a little bit of a caveat slash trigger warning for this talk. It's going to be a little bit different from some of the talks you may hear. It's on sexual consent, and the issues are very timely. And they're very provocative. So just as you listen to the presentation just and, and watch the presentation, just be aware of that. OK, so let's get started. So as you might have noticed over the last several years, the media overflows with stories about sexual assault. Every day, every week, we hear about another scandal, from Cosby to Betsy DeVos and Title IX to Harvey Weinstein finally the latest, uh, Me Too, and finally the latest uh, issue that has brought up sexual assault that has really provoked strong reactions. In this politicized atmosphere, the rape crisis has come to signify everything from the larger oppression of women to a political identity movement that strips men of due process. Terms like rape and sexual assault are thrown around to describe everything from forced intercourse to drunk fondling. Depending on what is measured, surveys put the prevalence of young women's victimization anywhere from one in three, for example, the University of Colorado Climate Survey that counted sudden kissing as an assault, or six in 1,000, as per the Department of Justice's 2014 survey, where sexual assault was coerced sex. The millennial discussion, therefore, feels like this constant struggle between feminist anti-rape sentiments and their civil libertarian concerns over due process and mass incarceration. So how did this all happen? Well, it happened a long time ago, but recent events we can trace to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? When, when the news broke of his decades of depraved behavior that went unpunished, the natural instinct amongst young women everywhere was to seek broadened definitions of sexual assault because they were outraged at this behavior. But sexual assault notions have been broadened to the point where, in a recent survey of 19 to 29-year-olds, 38% reported that it is sexual harassment for a man to comment on a woman's attractiveness. 29% said that winking at a, at a woman is sexual harassment, and 17% think it is harassing to ask a woman out, regardless of whether you work with her. So for feminists on the left, 
what kind of drives them absolutely crazy is this idea that powerful men, people like Weinstein, people like Donald Trump, people like Kavanaugh, can commit sexual assault with impunity. If they can just broaden the notion of rape to cover everything, if we can just water down due process so an accusation equals proof, then the groper in chief will fall. However, these Me Too sentiments of broadening liability, always believing the victim, watering down due process, they're complicated. And the politics and identity of Me Too are complex. And so far, they have not favored Democrats. Just ask Al Franken. So modern feminist abandonment of their liberal norms in the name of combating a scourge of gender violence does not primarily affect the untouchable privileged men who many women have in their mind when they support these kinds of broad policies. Rather, they purport to affect a different population altogether, the poor minorities who formed the police segment of our country. Now, interestingly, this realization that the distributional effects of these very broad sexual assault and sexual harassment policies might actually trickle down to the most marginalized men, only started sinking in on the Me Too level with the case of Aziz Ansari. Now, those of you who know Aziz Ansari know that he is far from a poor policed minority male, um, but he was enough of a difference from Harvey Weinstein to give millennial feminists pause, right? He's a man of color. He's a stereotype shatterer. He is uh, a feminist. So when the Aziz Ansari incident came out, it finally dawned, I think, on a lot of people within the Me Too movement that there was a natural stop gap to how far you could broaden the notion of sexual assault and how much process you could take down. All right, so for those of you who don't know, let me tell you a little bit about Aziz Ansari. Um, so Aziz Ansari, beloved actor, comedian, uh, stereotype shatterer, very millennial, right? A sort of millennial darling. Uh, and the story about him broke on a website called Babe.net. Anybody here heard of Babe.net? OK, so a few of you, right? So Babe.net is no Jezebel, OK? It's more of a tab tabloid type of website that was barely heard of until the Aziz Ansari story. Its uh, website, when you click on it and you see the sort of banner, is dedicated to, quote, girls who don't give an F. And the 22-year-old author, Katie Way, related the story of Grace, right, who says she was sexually assaulted by Aziz Ansari. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through all the very gory details of the story, but basically what had happened was uh, Grace, who was a uh, young 22-year-old aspiring photographer, met Aziz at some party. She was starstruck. He asked her on a date. She told all her friends, oh my god, I'm going out with Aziz Ansari. I hope he's like one of his characters. They went to an uneventful dinner. And afterwards, I guess she found out he wasn't like one of his characters uh, because he wanted sex. And they got into a situation where, to make a long story short, it was a very uncomfortable situation about sex where he was more uh, aggressively pushing it, not violently, but pushing for the sex. She was sort of pushing back, saying, let's take it slow. He'd say, OK, I'll take it slow. And then he'd try again. And so you get the scenario. And it culminated in sex. And sort of the upshot of uh, Grace's argument in the babe.net commentary is that Ansari assaulted her because he ignored her, quote, verbal and nonverbal cues to indicate how uncomfortable and distressed she was. Right? So it is not as though she said straight up no. It is not as though she resisted. But it's also not as though she said an enthusiastic yes. So the idea is, and I think you know, we don't have Ansari side of the story, but at least the way that the story goes, Ansari put subtle pressure on her. And although she went along with it, her bottom line is she only reluctantly gave in. Well, the next day, she carefully crafted a text with her friends to tell Ansari, you know, I really don't like what you did. I cried in the cab, blah, blah, blah. So he writes her back and actually says, I had a good time last night. To which she responds with her very carefully crafted text saying, you made me feel uncomfortable and all this. Uh, to which he responded, I'm so sorry. I never meant to do that, right? 
then it went away until in the midst of Me Too, the article appeared on Babe.net and it caused a storm, a storm of backlash against Ansari. He was not the millennial beloved hero that people had thought and against Grace, right, the woman who, who was the narrator, the protagonist of the story. And the interesting thing is a big portion of that backlash came from feminists within the Me Too movement, a backlash against Grace. One of those feminists was headline news anchor Ashley Banfield. She was scandalized that the activities that Grace described could possibly be categorized as sexual assault. And on her program, if you're familiar with Ashley Banfield, she trained her signature glare on the audience and directed her comments directly to Grace. If you were sexually assaulted, throw it across. If you were sexually harassed, get it out of your work, speak up and speak out loud. But by your own description, that is not what happened. You had an unpleasant face and you did not move. That is on you. And all the games that have been achieved and the girls that have been mine are now being compromised with their allegations written throughout there. And I'm going to call them reckless and tell it. I cannot name you publicly and sentence you to a similar career pit as I'm sorry, because you chose to remain anonymous. Lucky you. But as you grow in your photography career, I really do hope that you remember what you did to someone else's career, all because of that bad state. The next time you go on a bad date, you stand up sooner, you smooth out your dress, and you bloody well leave. Because the only sentence that a guy like that deserves is a bad kiss at Blue Ball, not a Hollywood black ball. Okay, so. <laughs> Katie Way, the 22 year old author of Babe.net, right, which is dedicated to, to girls who don't give an F did not take kindly to being dressed down by Ashley, right? And she complained on Twitter to her you know, wide audience of a completely different age of women and feminists. So in response, CNN asked her to come on the show, asked this author, Katie Way, because Grace is anonymous. And Katie Way responded to CNN in a screed of an email. And I will just let Ashley, who reads the email on her show, tell you about how Katie Way responded. So I want to be really clear. Uh, you spoke with the editor. Yes. Um, the uh, reporter who wielded those very powerful words said some choice words my way as well. Uh, curious about that. What did she say? So, and, and I want to share this um, because I think this gives us an insight into the caliber of the person who held that nuclear weapon. Uh, that was wielded on Ansari's career. The caliber of this 22-year-old young woman. And I'm only going to read a slight part of her comments to me. And I assume she fashions herself as feminist in this movement. Uh, Ashley, someone who I'm certain no one under the age of 45 has ever heard of. I hope the 500 retweets on the single news write-up made that burgundy lipstick, bad highlights, second-wave feminist has been really relevant for a little while. That's from Katie Way, who was on PBS this morning, uh, yesterday morning. Bad highlight, burgundy lipstick, second wave feminist has been. <laughs> yes, I relate to that. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, Ashley. <laughs> OK, so I mean, you can see here, we have now the, the beginnings of an intra-feminist cultural and generational divide going on right in front of us. And in fact, there was also a racial element thrown in. So columnist Caitlin Flanagan, who I think is somewhere in between the second wave has been and the sort of Katie Way generation, described the Babe.net um, article as a hit job and quote, 3,000 words of revenge porn. She mused, quote, I thought it would take a little longer for the hit squad of privileged young white women to open fire on brown-skinned men. So now we also have not just a generational feminist 
divide, but an intersectional feminist divide. And so you can see how um, Ansari and the whole Ansari case really blew up this idea that there was some form of woman's consensus on Me Too. And the idea of generally a woman's consensus on any of these issues has, it should have completely <laughs> fallen apart to anybody who's seen the voting patterns after Brett Kavanaugh. Women are a diverse group, right? And there is no women's view on these things. But what really shocked me about this Ansari case, which is kind of sad that this shocked me, but I'm a law professor. So what really shocked me as a law professor and somebody who writes on sexual consent was how shocked people were at this babe.net story and how shocked people were to think that Grace could possibly view what happened to her as sexual assault. Didn't people like Ashley and Caitlin Flanagan and all the other people who were criticizing Grace know? This ship had sailed years ago. Now, the burgundy lipstick second waivers were there through the whole thing, right? Grace described feeling coerced by Ansari's persistence, saying no several times, and importantly, Grace said she never said yes. She never expressed, quote, affirmative consent. Now, you're all thinking to yourself, but did she play along? Did she do it? She never said yes. Now, these behaviors are technically criminal under many statutes. Having sex with somebody who has been reluctant and hasn't said yes is, in fact, under the technical, and I'll say technical and explain that a little in a second, under the technical law of many jurisdictions, sex without affirmative consent is, in fact, a crime. Beyond that, in colleges throughout the nation, they, that ship so sailed. You can look in any college handbook, any campus handbook, and find all these kinds of requirements for having sex. You need ongoing, enthusiastic, thoughtful, verbal, continuous sex. Now, you're all laughing at me like I just made that list up, but I didn't make that list up. I have studied these lists, right? So this had all already happened. The law was already established by those second waivers imposed on the 22-year-olds. It is no wonder that Grace thought or could have thought that what happened to her was rape. So what happened? OK, so when the campus rape crisis and the mattress carrying happened, we had a lot of um, sloganism, right? And we had a practice in the sort of shadow of that sloganism. And the theory really never caught up to the practice. So you're probably familiar with a lot of these slogans, right? So during that era when everybody was worried that college students, for the most part, right, this was sort of concentrated on privileged college students, that they were having this kind of harmful sex, there was this whole idea of what consent meant and how to manage it very slogany, only yes means yes, right? Um, just because she's drunk. Do, do you guys remember seeing this one at CU Law, right? That was up there on the wall. Um, these, you know, and if you look at the imagery in these, I, I mean, just from a feminist perspective, I think the imagery of women in these uh, ads is quite disturbing. Um, but, the, but the idea is there are all these kinds of rules, and the rules basically say, unless it's under certain conditions, right, you don't want to have, uh, you, you can't have sex, right? It is unlawful to have sex. So basically, what happened in that moment was we had a law and society worried about the epidemic of campus sexual assault, and we had a lot of policy made in the shadow of that epidemic. Uh, epidemic and college bureaucrats basically told students, it is a violation of rules to have sex without affirmative consent. And so about, I would say at this point, six years ago, <coughs> affirmative consent just blew up. Now, those of you who've been sort of following rape and consent from the 90s, I don't know why any other, anybody other than me would have been doing that, but we'll remember that affirmative consent was actually a thing in the 90s. There was a famous Antioch College Code. Uh, it made SNL, it made Time Magazine, but, but, but at that time it was thought of as such a radical feminist idea that it was ridiculous. Right, so when I heard affirmative consent make its comeback a few years ago, my ears perked up and I thought, oh my gosh, right? This renewed affirmative consent. Maybe they've made some progress on what that means, right? Because it had already always struck me that um, people didn't really know what it meant. Okay, so then I did what a good law professor would do uh, when hearing a new legal term sort of crop up. I went on Google and I, 
and I typed affirmative consent into Google because I really wanted to just see like what was out there. And guess what? I got something. There was affirmativeconsent.com. So this came up. Um, and so it was a clearinghouse for affirmative consent. That was, you could get your affirmative consent gear on. Um, you could get a yes means yes kit with yes means yes guide cards. Now it looks funny. But the founder of the website, and it's actually quite a good resource. It's, it's very strange, and now it has like crate and barrel market. It's become very popular. You can see from the Google paid ads on it now. Um, but so these consent kits weren't supposed to be a joke. They really were supposed to start a conversation about how to have uh, uh, sex with consent so that you're not in violation of either written or unwritten rules of society. OK, so I was clicking around the affirmativeconsent.com. And uh, according to the website, there's two questions they get uh, with the most frequency. Question number one, what is consent? Question number two, how do I get it, right? So that was, <laughs> that was really the question. So I'm like, okay, well, what, are, what, are, what is their answer to these questions? And their answer to these questions was amazing. It was a montage of public service and like sort of college bureaucracy YouTube uh, clips, right? It was a, not a montage, but a, a bunch of links on how to have uh, sex with consent. So I went on these links and I, and I cobbled it together in a little video. And so I'll just uh, show you what it says. So what is consent? That's the first one. The second is what? S for yes, you shall yes for this. And what is it yes? Tell me how to have sex. It's not okay. Okay, so that's what I got out of college, <laughs> affirmativeconsent.com college code. And so the thing about it is there were like 10 different versions of what consent meant. My favorite one is what if, what if the person is too drunk to consent? Ask again. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's a very, I'm still confused at what the answer is. Some, some of it was verbal, some of it was nonverbal, some of it was a specific script, right? Um, but what it all does feel, right, when you read the babe.net babe article and see these regulatory sort of videos, is it feels like maybe younger feminism and millennial sensibilities are like neo-puritanical, right? Uh, maybe that, you know, the sexual liberation movement is over. Um, but I don't think so. I don't think that really describes the tension in babe.net. Because babe.net prides itself on utter irreverence towards sexual rules. See its feature, quote, I've cheated on every guy I've ever dated, and I don't feel even a little bit sorry. Women call for consent even as they participate in slot walks, right? Uh, so this idea that part of Me Too and part of this consent movement is also open sexuality is sort of absurdly reflected on, once again, affirmativeconsent.com. So here's an interesting little factoid about affirmativeconsent.com. I went back on it about a year ago just to see what had changed. And like I said, it had changed a lot. It had gotten a lot of site traffic. It now had crate and barrel, like how to decorate your dorm rooms and, and stuff like that. So it was like a money-making site. The consent kits that used to be $2.99 are now $14.99 and this. So I don't know if you can see this, it's pretty small, but so it says, what is a consent conversation there? It's like, what is affirmative consent, then what is a 
consent conversation. So when I clicked on that before, it went to all those videos, right, of the montage that I gave you. Um, those videos are gone. And when you click on um, that what is a consent conversation, you get two uh, different pages. So one possible page that you can get is what's a consent conversation. And the second possible page you get is this. So this is under what is affirmative consent. It is a list of dating apps that this affirmative consent.com gives you. And just for you know, those of you who are sitting in the back and can see, the middle one is called Bang With My Friends. No subtlety here either. Connect your Facebook account to BWF and choose which of your friends you'd be interested in spending the night with. If they have flagged you as well, the app will alert you. My favorite one is uh, Date My School, right? So once you get into Date My School, like once you're in, you can find co-eds, first of all, really co-eds? You can find co-eds, that's co-eds, right? That's not that. Co-eds on your campus who share your interests all without stepping out of your dorm room or actually talking to anyone. <laughs> The irony of an affirmative consent website linking to an app that tells you to have sex without talking to anyone, I, I mean, you can't make it up, right? So what is going on here? All of this can make the young sexual world seem incoherent, but I see it differently. What I see uh, is that the tension between over-the-top sexuality and intolerance for imperfect sex reflects contemporary feminists' struggle to embrace sexual liberation while simultaneously critiquing a schizophrenically regulated sexual terrain where all the burdens seem to fall on women. This is the struggle, and this has long been a struggle, how women can claim sexuality without being harmed by sexuality. And within this very complex, culturally ordered struggle, what we had was legislatures and college administrators come in with their language of the law, their language of perpetrators and victims, of criminal guilt and innocence, and impose from above a morally polar framework that simply does not capture the contemporary debate over sex. You're either a rapist or not. And we'll tell you the rule to govern it. You either have lawful sex with affirmative consent or you don't. Yet, in an effort to ensure appropriate enforcement, right, and to make sure that women aren't harmed and people aren't harmed, you can't outlaw all sex. If affirmative consent makes sex without an enthusiastic yes a crime, then it makes a lot of mutually desired sex unlawful, right? And it'd make a lot of banned fields snap. When I pose this question to affirmative consent proponents, with whom I am in conversation a lot, and these are law reformers and college code reformers, and I say, well, if you outlaw sex without a yes, you are making a lot of the sex people have every day a crime, right? Or expellable offense. And they say, well, no, no, we're not doing that, right? We're not doing that. We're just saying you have to have affirmative consent. Okay, right? So what is that? What is that thing we need to have? And do you know what? Most of the people who advocate very strongly for and against affirmative consent to sex have never addressed that question, the what is it question. Proponents just say, you know, it's whatever, you know, it's, 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 it's how people have sex, it's consent. Opponents say it's a contract and triplicate and it's ridiculous and nobody really bothers to find out what that thing is, so I did. And here's how it goes. I think we have a working concept of what a consensual tr sex transaction looks like. And right now I want to cabin, for those of you who are really into the philosophy of law and into criminal law, all the questions about why consent should be the framework, why there shouldn't be some other coercion framework, unequal bargaining power. I'm going to put all that to the side now. And I'm just going to focus on the fact that for most colleges and most people who are forward-thinking uh, rape law activists and reformers, consent is sort of the gold standard. So, okay, so what does a consensual uh, transa sex transaction between A and B mean? Well, I think we have this idea 
that there is a sex proponent and a sex acceptor, right? The idea that one person wants the sex more than the other person. All right, so the sex proponent wants the sex, and the sex acceptor then forms an internal decision on whether they are consenting or not to the sex. So what does that internal decision look like? Well, I mean, obviously it can have some parameters ranging from extremely consensual state of mind, right, to totally not consensual. Okay, so that's step one of the sex transaction. The sex acceptor decides they are willing or that they want to have sex. All right, so then we go to step number two, which is an external manifestation. And those things can also vary from what seems to be extremely consensual to things that seem to be not consensual. Now the problem with the internal decision and the external manifestation is they don't always line up perfectly, right? And so when you try to make linguistic rules like no, like no means no, it's very hard to do. Because if somebody put it in the way of this, so am I to assume you don't want to have sex with me? And the person says no, right? That clearly would be consent. Uh, so I just did a triple negative. That's how, I, that's how I worked that all in. But sometimes people do. Okay, so, so right, so that, that's, that's kind of one of the confusions even in a consent transaction. So in a perfect world, how we want it to happen is that the person forms a consensual state of mind. They clearly express in a way that comports with that state of mind, right? So then we have a step three. Uh, and this is very important in criminal law. This is what we would call the mens rea step in criminal law, right? And that, that B has to form a state of mind about A's state of mind, right? And these can range from innocent to criminal. So in a typically, uh, a typical consent, contested consent case, uh, what would happen is you would have the complainant and prosecutor saying that A actually didn't want to do it. You would have the defendant saying, I believed she did, or she's lying and she did, but let's go with the mens rea argument. I believe she did. And then it would be up to the fact finder, in a criminal case it would be the jury, to decide looking at the external manifestations in context who has the better of the argument. Okay, so that's straight up consent, right? So in other words, laws that say it is a crime to have sex without consent. My argument is this is what they have in mind. A person will say I didn't consent. The other person will say I did consent. And then it's up to the fact finder to look at all the other circumstances, whether there are prior consistent statements, whether there's you know, uh, external evidence or who seems more credible to determine who has the better of that issue. Okay, so now this was wholly unsatisfying to a lot of feminists, and the reason why is when the jury went to decide whether or not, um, you know, she actually didn't have a consensual state of mind, or whether she was telling the truth, or whether you could believe she did, what they'd end up doing was putting the victim on trial, right? So they would say, well, of course he has the better of the story because she wore this or she did this in the past. Uh, or they would say, oh, well, if we don't see some corroboration, we're not going to believe her, right? Anybody can make anything up. Right, so this was kind of worrisome. So there were several law reforms that feminists championed to get at this problematic situation where consent would invite the jury to kind of do a contest of who they liked better and women would lose the contest. So one of the reforms was rape shield laws, right? You can't bring in past sexual conduct evidence. It's too prejudicial. But another reform was affirmative consent. So what they said was this. We can't figure all this stuff out, right? So let's try to figure out a determinate method for deciding when sex is lawful or not. We'll look at whether there's affirmative consent. We'll look at the language. If there's a yes, good to go. If there's not, no, right? Now we can see the obvious problems with this. You can have an over and an under criminalization problem, right? The over criminalization problem is there are a billion other ways of expressing consent than yes. The undercriminalization is you can say yes when you're coerced, right? And that doesn't kind of take care of the situation either. But it stuck, right? And it came back with a vengeance in me too. So the first step of affirmative consent is to get rid of the internal decision. And the second one is to sort of uh, focus on those external manifestations. Okay, so why am I harping on this? Why does it matter so much? The reason it matters is because in an ordinary 
consent jurisdiction or under an ordinary consent standard. All external manifestations are fair game. In other words, a uh, defendant can say, look, here are the five things the complainant did to make me think that there was consent, right? And the jury has to look at those five things in context and decide. Affirmative consent's intervention is deliberately made to narrow that world to a much smaller world of manifestations. Only some things count as affirmative consent. So it doesn't matter if she did X, Y, and Z. It only matters if there was, for example, a yes. So even if the defendant could honestly and reasonably believe that the other person consented, and even if a jury would agree with the defendant that he could honestly and reasonably believe the other person consented, unless the <coughs> performance, and this is very important, not the state of mind, but unless the performance of consent fit into that little category, it was a crime. Okay, so then, so then it would behoove us to know what's in that category, right? Because if the performance has to be in it, you're not allowed to have sex unless the other person is falling within that category. Okay, so this gets to what affirmative consent means. And so I look through a lot of statutes uh, and a lot of um, uh, laws to try to figure it out. Okay, so according to the sort of backlash to affirmative consent, it means a signed contract in triplicate. In other words, you can't have sex unless you have it signed, you know, stamped, notarized, and then you're good to go. Um, and some people are saying, I'm, I'm thinking about that these days. Kind of fair, thinking about it these days. Well, okay, for the most part, no. Affirmativeconsent.com says it. Conservative backlash to affirmative consent says it, but it's not really what affirmative consent is. Now, here's another one. All right, you can only have sex when there is an enthusiastic, hedonic, emotionally secure yes, right? So you also have to like, like so this, this, is, this is a huge one in the feminist literature, actually. There is an entire literature on how like, most of the sex we have is terrible from a feminist perspective. Maybe you can't criminalize it, but it should go something like this. And then there's uh, another school, and I'm not going to get into it, called Radical Sex Positive. People who think this is all horrible, like this is like a dystopian world because it's so boring. Um, but some college codes actually say enthusiastic. They actually cancel <laughs> students. You have to think about it. You have to know that your partner has thought about it. There are a lot of rules in there. Um, okay, so a verbal yes, that's the one we've heard of a lot. That's the yes means yes college policy. Um, stop asking, get some permission. So this is the idea. Um, there are a lot of colleges uh, that call for this kind of a thing. So if you're going along in intimate behavior, at some point the person has to stop and get permission um, and you have to wait for the permission. It doesn't necessarily have to be verbal, but it has to be clear. So the importance of this policy is what you might think of as, I guess this is a very second wave, or I'll just say it, 1980s vernacular, as moving from one base to another in a sexual, I don't know, baseball game. <laughs> um, that can't happen, right? That can't happen lawfully. There has to be at some point a stop and ask. And college codes, and I actually think this is, an, this is a technically impossible requirement, they want this kind of permission to be, quote, ongoing. Okay, so you can't have an ongoing verbal expression of consent. That's just, I mean, what would that even sound like? You probably epistemologically can't have an ongoing internal consent, right? That, that doesn't even comport with psychology. So a lot of them say, well, okay, you know, what we really mean is you need specific consent to each act. But again, this is a problem. I mean, those of you who are criminal lawyers know the multiplicity problem. What act? You know, which act and which is consent to it? And how do I start it if I needed consent to that first act and it doesn't consent to the second, right? So it's, it's um, they're very strict policies, these affirmative consent policies. I actually think this is the burgeoning common understanding of affirmative consent. And I have a feeling, and I'm, you know, I don't have a crystal ball on it, but we have about 22 jurisdictions, criminal jurisdictions, that use the affirmative consent language. I think they have been applied as ordinary consent statutes thus far. I think we'll see more and more that they're going to be applied in a, in a different way, in a stricter way, because of the revolution in college codes. Um, so then you have clear consent, many college policies, 
and uh, any words or conduct that convey consent, that basically collapse affirmative consent back into ordinary consent. So I'm thinking that the burgeoning understanding is somewhere along stop and ask. And what that means is this. OK, so basically, let's say we have a couple, right? This lovely couple. So I, actually, I got this picture of this couple because I typed in college couple on a date, you know, like college date. <laughs> this is a college couple on a date? I would think there'd be like a funnel and like <laughs> college couple. OK, so at time one, we have the college couple on the date, right? Um, at time two, we have the bases. And at time three, we have sex. Basically, what affirmative consent is telling people is that there has to be something else going on in order for this, big red sex, to be legal. So what do those things have to be? It has to be some form of an ask and answer. What can that be? Maybe it can be like a do you want to do it or a shall we? I like to do it in robot voice, like do you give me affirmative consent to sex? <laughs> right? Like, something like that. And there has to be some sort of answer, like let's get it on, emoji. I guess they don't call it emoticons anymore. Emoji. Because uh, a lot of this is going to be done through apps and through texts at this point or the, the <coughs> robot voice. OK. Now, so according to most affirmative consent proponents, the script can vary. But what is clear is this. Without some script, without that purple box, it is rape, right? It is sexual assault. OK, so that, I want to be very clear, is what we're talking about. I'm not talking about a contract, but I'm also not talking about <coughs> nothing. There are performative requirements attended to affirmative consent. And remember, the reason why is they were too worried if you left it to the jurors to decide on whether or not it was consent, it would be too defense friendly. OK, so um, I, I don't even know how long I've gone, but it's probably a long time. Jim? OK, so I'm at 40 minutes. OK, so then let me, let, me just, let me just close it down. And let me just quickly put one, uh, l let me just flash you a couple more slides. So I think that there are some uh, arguments for and against affirmative consent. People don't usually categorize them. Because affirmative consent has been this juggernaut, right? It's sort of grown up in the shadow of Me Too, in the shadow of the campus rape crisis, that nobody's ever really talked about. Like, what does it mean to move from this internal, you know, three-step consent requirement to this thing where you have to say certain things and do certain things? Um, so there are four categories of arguments that proponents make. One is empirical. They argue that affirmative consent, affirmative consent, actually reflects the way young people. Uh, you know, have sex these days, right? I've had this told to me many times. I mean, I really have. I've been on panels with people in their 20s, um, and they look at me and, and they're like, well, you just wouldn't know. <laughs> and I'm like, is, is it my burgundy lipstick that is giving me away? Um, now, this sounds true, right? But it's not. It's, it's actually just wrong. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the other reasons why. Why? Because, you know, fine, we know that everybody can say yes means yes. But the social science tells us people don't practice yes means yes, especially young people. So when they ask young people in all of these college surveys that they've now done over the past few years, what is consent? They're all very good. They say a verbal yes. They say ask and answer. They say yes means yes. When they ask college students, describe your last sexual encounter, They'll describe a sexual encounter that they liked. There will nary be a yes in the narrative. So this is just the reality. So the empirical argument fails a little bit. OK, so I just wanted to show you that. Um, and then the next argument is an aspirational argument. Actual practice should involve affirmative consent. So even if we don't do it now, here's how the argument goes. If you teach enough people in freshman orientation or in second grade or whenever, uh, through a public service amount, announcement with Ryan Gosling, right? If you, if you show enough Ryan Gosling to people, they'll get it, right? And they'll start you know, having sex in the way we want them to. I mean, there are two sort of issues with that. Number, number one is the empirical issue. Number one is a no, they won't, OK? And number two is, well, what happens in the in-between time when people are following the cultural practice? Do we sacrifice them? Do we put them in jail because we want to really shove along this cultural transformation? 
And then there's a third argument. And this, I'll, I'll just go a little bit on the, on the sex radical tip with this one. So the third argument on aspiration is, what does our affirmative consent world look like? And is it utopian or is it dystopian? And I think I've got an argument for dystopian. And this is my argument, the We Consent app. This is my argument for dystopian. The We Consent app was floated by some like, um, you know, uh, tech growth mindset sort of how technology interacts with people app company. And they, you know, marketed it and sold it to colleges and to different people. And the idea was that this was going to help us manage this fraught world. And, but this is how it works. This is what's so crazy about it. So you've got your, you know, two-way camera thing on your phone. And when you're about to have sex, you're, you're recording this consent conversation. But then it gets encrypted to a cloud that you, the people in the sex transaction, cannot get to. The only people who can get to it are cops and administrators in the event of a dispute. So it's an evidence-preserving function, not even a sexual communication function. Okay, and we could go through the equities of that, but that's kind of scary to me. Okay, here's the second app in the package. What about no? And this is kind of like, I'm just gonna leave it on this note because this goes for dystopian and you could make to me a million <laughs> arguments that we have better sex now in the affirmative consent world, but this certainly isn't it. It says, hey women, if you wanna say no to sex, but you're too scared, here's how you do it. Activate the app, because we will show a video of a white police officer waggling his finger at the guy saying, no, 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 no. And that's how you should do it, okay? So as for empirical and aspirational, I'm not so sure about that. But that isn't my biggest problem with affirmative consent right now. I think we can have about a debate about affirmative consent in colleges and whether it's expelling the wrong people or the right people or how it distributes. That is fair, and I'm, I'm ready to have that discussion. But my real worry is how I see it trickle out into criminal law. In affirmative consent, we have a lot of experience with these broad over-criminalization statutes, like, for example, trespass and loitering statutes. Everybody trespasses and loiters, right? Not everybody gets caught for trespassing and loitering. And that is the reason why the public tolerates trespassing and loitering statutes. There will be many people not using their what about no app, right? Every day across the nation, people will be violating the criminal sex offense laws. But only some people will ever see those laws applied to them. And that is the only reason why people will tolerate them. Now, we have a story about when more privileged actors have fallen under affirmative consent. That story is Betsy DeVos. She reversed it. And it may yet go like that. It may yet be that this is so regulatory that it'll fall on privileged people. But I've seen the criminal law up close, and I've seen how overbreath works. And if prosecutors confine their affirmative consent prosecutions, and they won't be prosecutions, they'll be using the affirmative consent broad language to induce a plea. If they use this plea bargaining tool against the usual suspects, then we can just file it along with trespassing, except it'll be registrable and people will go to jail for a long time for having sex no differently than the way other people do. So that's really my problem with it, you know, all sort of jokes aside, and I do like to joke about it, is that I do worry about the sort of uh, trickle-down effect of these college policies that are very social media and very hip and very cool and very virtue signaling that they'll have real world effects on a very different population than Weinstein, Kavanaugh, or anybody we might imagine they should have effects on. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Um, and yeah, so we don't need Lawrence versus Texas, and I will welcome questions. <laughs> Um, okay. Did I just answer all of your questions about this? Uh, yes, sir. In the third one, Colorado criminal law. So Colorado criminal law makes rape a crime where you have to use means to overcome the will of another. So we would actually classify that under force. 
Um, so you actually have to do something in order to cause, right, before it's a rape crime, right, in order to cause somebody to have sex against their will. And that's kind of where rape law started, right? Like the whole idea is why would anybody have sex against their will if they weren't being forced, right? So if there's no force, then it's not a crime. Well, I think the feminist answer to that was no, but people, you know, feel subtly pressured, right? They feel um, intimidated. Uh, and so we want to get at that, and that was the move to consent. But Colorado criminal law still keeps the force requirement. I'm not so sure about the lesser offenses, because I don't want to teach them. Um, so, yes? So, right, okay, exactly. So then it's only the high, the, yeah, it's only the highest one that the, the, the means is only the highest level of rape. So that's very typical where you'll have the force, coercion, like violence be, you know, a life offense. But then the non-consent, the straight up non-consent, which remember, 22 jurisdictions say lack of affirmative consent. That's their version of non-consent. Can carry up to 20 years or so. What? Right, right, Colorado, right. But for every sex offense, right? Like so even, yeah, yeah. So, so. Yeah. For their life, right. And it was only until recently, if I remember, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that like they even started letting the indeterminate life people out. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, and so for my worry here, so given that, right, like so with the force one, that's, that's a different issue. I also think the college codes affect force. But with consent, right, there's an interpretive question there. What is consent? And the more the college regime of consent is a very narrow set of performances, filters out, the more you're going to see prosecutors use it that way, juries think of it that way, judges use it that way. So even though we don't have criminal statutes saying only yes means yes, I think this is going to have like a downstream effect. You know, we have an affirmative consent standard in the CU code and ongoing and all that, all the typical college language. Um, so, you know, and other jurisdictions also, they do in fact say an affirmative, an affirmative, a freely given affirmative expression of consent. And so that I think invites this sort of stop and ask analysis. So I do think, you know, you know, we don't have evidence that that's how the criminal law is being interpreted, but I think it stands to reason that, you know, the more people have an understanding that consent is very narrow in that way, the less it's going to be sort of up to juries to decide whether there was consent and more it's going to be looking at these specific performances. Yeah. So within the affirmative consent framework, how do you decide who is the sex victim and who is sexer, especially without relying on other norms of sexual harassment? Uh, thank you, because I forgot that. I went off notes. And, 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 and so, so I'm going to have to like scroll really back here now. But I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> okay, this too. Let me just scroll past this. I know that's a lot of clicking. This. I do want to say one thing about this. The more I look at this, the more A appears to have feminine features to me. You know, it's like one of those tests where I always call A she, right? And so I think that this whole idea of there having to be a sex proponent who, and what the college codes say, ensures the consent of the other is assuming a very hetero cis man woman relationship, right? In which, in only two people, in which, oh, three people, you're probably already into the like unconsensual stuff, but like <laughs> in which the male takes on the prototypically patriarchal role of making sure that the sex is copacetic. And beyond that, the co I mean, this is this is rife throughout the sort of me to college uh, code reform is this idea of bystander intervention and intervening with men. All those, you know, if she's drunk, it doesn't, you know, if you look at the images of the women, and I just kind of said that they, they were a little bit disturbing. I'm not going to look at this again. You know, I said they were a little bit disturbing. Uh, right? This one is my favorite. Um, I mean, she is completely helpless. This is a helpless human being with very little agency, 
the men exercise the agency. And in fact, bystander men exercise agency in stopping other men from having sex. When the whole Rolling Stone, do you guys remember the Rolling Stone case? When that whole debacle came and all the fraternities at University of Virginia were in huge trouble, what the fraternities decided to do at parties was post frat brothers by the stairs to stop couples from going up and having sex. So the idea was that these men would be the foot soldiers of stopping sex that would inevitably be bad for the women, whatever the condition they were in, right? And so when this It's On Us initiative came from the top, it came from Uncle Joe Biden. And when Joe Biden uh, announced the initiative, what he said is, like, this initiative comes from a very personal place for me. In my neighborhood, if a man raised his hands to a woman, you'd beat the crap out of him. So when you think of some of this college expansion of sex regulation as being a feminist thing, and then look at some of the images and rhetoric and sort of the, the construction of women in it, 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 it I mean, it, you know, I, I've, I've gone back to a hetero thing, but like it's, it's not just heteronormative, but it's heteronormative in a patriarchal way, right? Like, so it's like, not just do we assume there are genders, and assume that only opposite genders have sex, we also assume that they perform woman and man, and in fact, we're requiring them to perform woman and man. So, great, I didn't know we were gonna go there in this talk, did I? but I'm glad we did. Yes. Okay, so that's a really good question. Let me unpack a few things in there. Because I think one of your questions, I think your main question is about, if the, let's, let's put it in a criminal context. If the defendant was voluntarily intoxicated to the point where they, they didn't know what was going on, they couldn't form intent, right? They, they didn't even know the other person was drunk. Uh, is that a defense? From my experience, and I'll, I'll just check with you of Colorado, voluntary intoxication is not a defense to rape. N that's very typical. That's a very typical construction. Um, and that's a construction that you see in colleges too. Um, now, codes have incorporated reasonableness standards. In other words, you're only guilty if it was unreasonable for you to believe the person consented. And you could sort of backdoor drunkenness into like who's the reasonable person in this situation. Is it a reasonable drunk college student? But just on the defense of I didn't know, right, which is oxymoronic. I know. I didn't know because I was too drunk, for the most part, no. So that's bringing up your second question, which is drunk, drunk, sex, right? Two people are drunk, okay, A and B are drunk, B initiates sex, A is a rapist. Can that be? A and B are drunk, B initiates, absolutely. In fact, college codes use that as an example. John and Sarah has, have sex. Uh, John and Sarah are drunk. Sarah says, John have sex with me, John has sex with her, but Sarah was really drunker than him, right? So absolutely, even the person who's the more passive party, the sex acceptor, can flip over into the defendant category if both people are drunk. And so then you're saying to yourself, well, wait a second, wait a second. Doesn't that mean that every incident, incident of intoxicated sex produces two victims and two perpetrators? And I have brought this up to Title IX experts. And you could imagine what the answer is. What's the answer? Yes. What's the answer? Yes. If you and I beat each other up, we are victims and perpetrators. If you and I have sex under conditions which are unlawful, you and I are hurt. Now the reality is, this is in a way, in a weird socially constructed way, ruled by masculine and feminine culture and how people understand imperfect sex incidents. So in the morning, when they both wake up having no idea what happened, and his friend says to him, oh, you had sex with her last night. The expectation is, right, the social expectation is, he'll go, awesome, right? And then her friends say, oh my god, oh my god, that guy had sex with you last night. That is totally not cool. And she'll be like, oh my god, I feel horrible, right? So there is a gendered social construction here. I, I, there's no way we can disagree with that. 
My problem with the law intervening uh, in that situation in, in a very gender way is I think, you know, as much as we want the law to protect women in the sort of situation they find themselves in as people living in patriarchy, I don't think we want the law to reinforce that patriarchal view. <coughs> patriarchal view. So it's a very difficult thing. So I agree with you. That, you know, in the college mindset, they are both criminals and victims. And yes, the, real, the distributional reality is it will be mediated by gender. I mean, I think on the college campus, yeah, I think on the college campus, mediation is a great idea. Um, it, when you talk to a lot of the college students that are more unsure about what happened, they're not sure they want to go through the entire sort of um, adversarial Title IX process. Studies show that that adversarial Title IX process is traumatic for everybody involved and very bad for their educational experience. So itself seems like a violation of Title IX. Um, some of them, they just want him to not be in the dorm or they want a different class schedule or something like that. And it would seem to me to be something that the university should welcome, right? To resolve things at the lowest level, to plea bargain it out. Um, in the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, the federal government forbid it. You couldn't do mediation. Now that's been rescinded, but I'm pretty sure, and Professor White knows this a little bit better than I, that that anti-mediation is part of currently pending Colorado legislation. So it might become a Colorado state rule. So I think DeVos did the right thing to allow there to be options. But unfortunately, um, you know, it, it might become a matter of state law now. In the criminal, we could talk, but, but I definitely think that's the answer for schools. Should I take one more or should I stop? We could continue into, yeah, exactly, the next yeah, time. So I think I'll, I'll stop there because my boss <laughs> has stood up. <laughs>